So what are the consistent features of NDEs that are independent of cultural models? First, we have changes in thinking during the NDE. Thoughts are usually described as being much faster and clearer than normal thoughts. There's a sense of losing concept of time. Time becomes timeless or it doesn't exist anymore. There's an intensive life review in which people have their whole lives flash before us. And in some cases, they review these events, not just through their own eyes, but through the eyes of other people who are involved in the situation. There's also often a sense of a, uh, a sort of a revelation or a sudden understanding of everything. Um, things that were a puzzle to them in normal everyday life become totally clear to them in the NDE. There are also changes in feeling during the NDE. They have a sense of overwhelming peace and well-being, a sense of joy sometimes, a feeling of cosmic unity or being one with everything, and a sense of receiving unconditional love, often from a divine source. Furthermore, there are what we call paranormal features, for lack of a better term, which include preternaturally vivid senses, hearing and vision being much more vivid than ever before. People often report seeing colors they'd never seen before, hearing sounds they'd never heard. They sometimes have a sense of extrasensory perception, um, seeing things and hearing things that they could not usually see uh, in normal life that were outside the range of their uh, vision and hearing. They sometimes have visions of future events as well that come true. And many of them report a sense of out of being, of being out of the body and seeing accurately things from an out of body perspective. Um, Jan mentioned this as being the vertical out-of-body uh, experiences. Um, she did a study actually collecting almost 100 uh, published accounts of, of out-of-body experiences and found that in 92% of them, they were corroborated by other people as being completely accurate. So we're not dealing with this the occasional case that's accurate, but the vast majority of them are accurate perceptions. Then there are the otherworldly features, for lack of a better term again. People saying that they are part of some other realm or dimension. People encountering some mystical being that they can't identify or sometimes they can't identify as a deity. Uh, seeing the spirits of deceased loved ones and finally coming to a border or point of no return beyond which they can't continue and still come back to life. So how do the medical establishment uh, explain these phenomena? Well, the first explanation that was put forward was the, a lack of oxygen to the brain. And this was plausible because no matter how you come close to death, a lack of oxygen is usually one of the final common pathways. However, we know from decades of clinical research what happens when you get lack of oxygen to the brain. You become confused, frightened, uh, belligerent, agitated, quite different from the calm and consistent NDEs. Furthermore, we now have uh, several studies um, done by Mike Sabom in the US and by Sam Parnia in the UK, in which they actually measured oxygen levels in people as they were close to death. And they found that those who reported NDEs actually had higher oxygen levels than those who didn't report NDEs. So lack of oxygen was not causing these experiences. Likewise, there was a theory that drugs given to people as they were approaching death caused NDEs. And there were studies done in India by Carlos Osis and Erlander Haraldson and in the US uh, by our research group at, at UVA that show that the more drugs people are given as they approach death, the less likely they are to report NDEs and the less likely they are to have an elaborate one. There were also theories that brain chemicals produced under stress are causing NDEs. And people often report or, or relate this to endorphins, the feel goods hormones that are produced under stress or ketamine-like drugs or DMT-like drugs. Now, many of these drugs they, they uh, attribute this NDE to uh, are not really known to exist in the brain. They're just hypothesized. But even those that we know exist, like the endorphins, are usually released in such tiny amounts for such a short period of time in some part of the brain we haven't identified that it would be virtually impossible to test these theories by what we know now. You don't really go into a brain and, and assay it when someone is in a near-death crisis. Then there are reports that some brain electrical activity occurring at the point of death or just after death is causing the NDE. And people most often report to the temporal lobe because there were reports that in temporal lobe seizures, people have 
uh, out-of-body experiences. And there are reports that when you stimulate the temporal lobe electrically, you, you invoke a, uh, a out-of-body experience. Well, actually several studies have done, been done now looking at huge cohorts of people with temporal lobe seizures. We did one here, Peter Fennick did one in the UK. And we found that um, there was nothing at all resembling a near-death experience in temporal lobe seizures, it just doesn't exist. Furthermore, if you look at the reports that are produced by stimulating the, the brain electrically, you have people reporting bizarre bodily sensations like a feeling of their legs getting much longer or a feeling of sliding off the table that are not exactly out-of-body experiences. Then there are reports that there was a, quote, death surge of electrical activity shortly after someone dies, going for 30 seconds after the heart stops. This was a study done in rats. Uh, they uh, put cardiac uh, rats into cardiac arrest and then measured the brain waves before and after. And they found that in some of the rats, but not all of them, there was a brief surge of electricity that lasted about 30 seconds. If you actually look at the data they produced, this surge was actually a tiny fraction of the electrical activity in the brain before they killed them. So it's really hard to call it a surge. Furthermore, they didn't bother to interview the rats to see what they experienced. And we have data from humans of going back, clinical data going back decades, who happened to have their EEGs being measured uh, during the death process. And we do not find anything like a death surge in humans. In fact, in most people who have a cardiac arrest, the EEG starts changing in a matter of four or five seconds. And within 20 seconds, it's totally flat. So you don't have a death surge in humans. There was also a theory recently by Kevin Nelson at the uh, University of Kentucky, a neurologist, who said that REM activity, which is the type of brain activity you have during dreams, intrudes into the near-death experience and causes these bizarre sensations. Well, one of the problems with that is uh, drugs like um, anesthesia, anesthetics, uh, inhibit REM activity. And yet we have lots of NDEs that occur under anesthesia. Furthermore, Willie B. Britton, a psychologist, actually measured REM activity in near-death experiences and in other people. And she found that the near-death experiences actually have less REM, REM activity than the control populations. So there doesn't seem to be any data to support the REM intrusion theory. And in fact, there's data against it. Okay, there in addition, there are proposed psychological explanations. And this is most often attributed to our expectation of what's going to happen or wishful thinking. You know, you think you're dying, so of course you want to reunite with loved ones, so you imagine seeing them. And the problem with this theory is that we have lots of NDEs in which people see things they were not expecting. Uh, people often report wanting to see a deceased parent, and instead they saw a hated uncle who came to them. Um, we also have a lot of NDEs from children who didn't have a lot of expectation of what would happen at, at death, and they report the same type of NDEs that adults do. There are also lots of accounts of NDEs from people who were atheists, who were uh, not at all expecting to see a deity in their NDE, and yet did. And then we have experiences in which people saw uh, deceased people deceased loved ones who were not known at the time to be dead. Um, and that kind of takes away the expectation hypothesis. If you didn't know they were dead, you wouldn't expect to see them. And yet we have lots of cases of these. About a decade ago, I published a paper with about uh, 20 or 30 of these cases. And we have some going back to ancient Rome. NDEs have also been attributed to psychological traits. And the one that's most common cited, which does seem to have some validity to it, is the concept of boundary thinness or transliminality um, or access to inner experience. In other words, people who are good at remembering their dreams are more likely to report an NDE. Um, you may also put this back the other way around to say that people who have thick boundaries, people who never remember their dreams, um, don't report NDEs. And that kind of makes sense that if you have no access to your inner, inner thoughts, if you don't usually have any access to it. If you did have an NDE, you might not be able to remember that when you came back. Then many people report that their NDEs were attributed to mental illness. 
actually, if you look at the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is psychiatrists and psychologists' Bible about uh, diagnoses, no hallucination or delusion by itself is evidence of a mental illness. You must have, in addition to the strange symptom, significant distress or impairment. And most NDEers do not show this significant distress and impairment. Uh, furthermore, we have data now looking at the incidence of mental illness among people who have NDEs. And we find that it's the same as the incidence of mental illness in people who don't have NDEs. There's no difference at all. They're not, they don't have more, they don't have less. We also looked at people who came to a psychiatric hospital for treatment and looked at the incidence of NDEs among that group. And we found that they have the same amount of NDEs as people who didn't come for psychiatric treatment. So there seems to be no connection between NDEs and mental illness.